I don't know where Ebby is. I don't know where she is or who took her, and I don't know what situation she's in. Abby Jane Stebbick loved the beach. Sand under her toes and sunshine in the sky. She was a teen in 2015, so she tweeted about it. She did not love the rain. So it seemed almost fitting in the days that followed her disappearance that the town of Little Rock, Arkansas was filled with rain. Dark clouds, wet drops, day after day, while her family searched everywhere for her, day after day. Evie's family did so much searching alone in those first few days, without the assistance of large volunteer groups or law enforcement. Of course, it's hard to say where that relationship first went wrong, their relationship with law enforcement, but I think it happened right away. The police department in Little Rock did not show much urgency in the initial search for Abby, which is really unfortunate because a little more help early on in this case might have made all the difference. While Little Rock police detectives were waiting for Ebby to show back up, storms came in and washed away what might have been important evidence. A little more help early on might have kept her friends and loved ones from enduring years of this desperate search disrupted by more than just rain. Described as loyal, fiercely independent, and with a good sense of humor, Ebby loved music, the color purple, and makeup. She was learning three new languages. She liked learning. She didn't always like her name. She sometimes went by Ebby Jane instead of Ebby. She sometimes used her stepfather's last name. Her friend, Danielle Westbrook, described her as rebellious as well as independent. Sometimes when she argued with her parents, she would end up at Danielle's house, avoiding her home and the family conflict. Ebby was an adult. She had turned 18 on March 31st that year and had made some pretty big changes in her life. She had decided to start her senior year that fall at Little Rock Central High School, a large public school, and a big switch from the small charter school she had been attending. She'd gotten a new job, too, at Foot Locker that summer before her senior year of high school. Her mom said she worked all the time. We were so proud of her. But just a few weeks into the school year, a conflict regarding marijuana use got so heated that Abby moved out. It was late September, about a month before her disappearance. She didn't really have a reliable place to stay. This part reminds me so much of the Angela Freeman case, honestly. Ebby stayed for a while with her brother, but in the days leading up to her disappearance, she was actually staying with friends and at her grandparents, who she was close with. On Tuesday, October 20th, 2015, just four days before she vanished, she sent Danielle a Snapchat and asked to stay over. They re-pierced her nose and hung out before going to bed. It was the last time they saw each other. Friday, October 23rd, Abby went to a small party with a new group of friends. And I say friends with quotation marks because these people did not act like Abby's friends. Danielle had declined the invite, not knowing any of the other attendees. At this party, four men participated in Evie's sexual assault and videotaped the event. Evidence, I found, suggests that she confided in two trusted men about the encounter via text message, her friend Gage and her stepdad Michael. Her stepfather told the Arkansas Democrat Gazette she went out that Friday night and the things that happened changed her. It blindsided us. Ebby confided in her stepfather about the assault that very next night after resting up at her grandparents. She reached out for his support and told him that she wanted to report the rape to the police. Cell phone records would show that she had already called the Little Rock Police Department twice that evening, though they do not report any record of these calls. Each was only about a minute long. 
like I'm sure anyone reeling in the horrific hours following a sexual assault would be, Ebby appears to be very upset and also conflicted. She and her friend Danielle had chatted on Saturday, but it appears that Ebby could just not share the terror of her Friday night with Danielle, or at least not over the phone. She told Danielle that she would be staying with her brother, and the two made plans to meet up on Sunday at the church ice cream social. Despite telling Danielle that she'd stay with her brother, she had told her grandparents that she'd be spending the night at their house. Her grandfather recounted to the press, She said, I'll be back. Don't lock the door. I'll be back to spend the night. But they never saw her again. Abby had been making plans to meet his trusted stepdad, Michael, to go to the police, but then stopped responding to his texts after leaving her grandparents' house. Michael went to her grandparents looking for her, but she had already left. Their calls to her cell phone that night went unreturned. More than 20 hours pass before anyone speaks to Ebby again. The next evening, Ebby answers a call from her brother, Trevor. So many people had called her that day, but finally, for someone, she had picked up the phone. She sounds panicked and confused. She tells him that she's in her car outside his home, but when he checks outside for her, she isn't there. So he calls her back quickly. It's about 5.30 p.m. When he calls back, he determines that she's lost. She's in her car, but she doesn't know where. I'm fucked up, she told him, before hanging up the phone. This is the last time anyone speaks with Ebby Stebbick. Cell phone records indicate that it is this evening that she stops opening text messages. When Ebby's brother immediately reaches out to law enforcement after this alarming phone call, they tell him that he will need to wait 12 hours to report her missing. Ebby is an adult after all. However, Ebby's family will later learn that waiting 12 hours is not an official formality for the Little Rock Police Department. I suspect that some of the complications in getting attention on this case came from Ebby's place of residence. She didn't really have one. After moving out of her parents' house, she bounced around a bit, staying with friends and family. And so I don't think that the Little Rock police really took her brother or her parents seriously when they reported her missing. How could she be missing when there's nowhere she's supposed to be? If she's not expected home, she could and should be, well, anywhere. But Abby wasn't just anywhere. She was in desperate need of help. And so was her family. When Abby doesn't meet Danielle at the ice cream social, there's no immediate sense of alarm for her. But as the night goes on, she gets a text from Abby's younger sister. Trevor has alerted the rest of his family about the disturbing phone call he just received. And now Harris Stebbick is looking for anyone who might be with Abby. Danielle reaches out to her friend and when she receives no response, she knows that something terrible is wrong. She describes it as her shattered heart falling out of her chest. There is panic as Ebby's family and friends search for the missing teenager. Rain has been falling much of the day and after some warm fall weather earlier in the week, temperatures have fallen and the day ends cold and dark. Abby's whereabouts are unknown. The next day, Monday, October 26th, law enforcement are more receptive to the family's concerns. The Little Rock police take the missing persons report and detectives tell the family that they think Abby will show up on her own. These are assurances that fall flat when her friends and family are certain that she's not gone on her own accord. Unable to just sit and wait for her return, they continue the search for Abby. Monday and Tuesday, again, are cold, rainy, miserable days. Through the damp and cold, the mud, the puddles, her family hunts for signs of Abby. They check the homes of her friends, the places she liked to go and spend time, parks, stores, restaurants, yogurt shops. 
Wednesday, October 28th, a security guard at Chalamont Park, a small neighborhood playground and pool, reported an abandoned vehicle parked near the woods. He waited for police to arrive that night, but they did not. According to reporting by Mitch McCoy with KARK News, the guard, Guy Hooper, calls three times over a span of several days before Little Rock police arrive to look into the tip. It is two days after the first report of the vehicle on October 30th that law enforcement finally arrive and determine that the 2003 Volkswagen Passat is registered to Ebby's father, who they call. And it's Ebby's father that tells the police that the car was in use by the missing teenager. It is more wasted time. The police department also declines to ping Ebby's phone to see where she was when she had her final conversation with her brother. Those early hours, early days, early weeks are critical, Michael Jernigan, Ebby's stepfather, lamented. The car is a disaster inside. Clothes and makeup are scattered all over the interior. Her phone, wallet, contact lenses are all in the front seat. The car's keys are in the ignition and the battery is dead. It's not how a runaway would leave. What 18 year old leaves her cell phone or their clothes, her makeup? She spent all of her money on makeup. Her contact lenses? She can't see without contacts, said her mom. Little Rock Police Department impound the vehicle but leave the trunk open in the course of the investigation. Again, plagued by fall Arkansas rain, a storm sweeps through, damaging the car interior and many of Evie's belongings. As the days pass, they interview her family and friends. Finding her car fuels the search for Evie. An image from a nearby surveillance video is released by the media but little other information is made available. Several of Abby's friends were called hunting for clues around Chalamont Park. Kaylee Foley, who had met Abby at a previous place of employment, had spent over an hour being interviewed by the Little Rock Violent Crimes Detectives on the afternoon of November 3rd. With Abby heavy on her heart, Kaylee and her mom, Margie, head to Chalamont Park to look around. What they found was so disturbing that they immediately called the police. First, they reach out to the detective that they had just been with. When he doesn't answer or call them back, Margie dials 911. And I brought my daughter here, who's a friend of hers, and we just started walking around and I could smell the composition. So I was just tried to call his phone and okay. he didn't call me back. Could you all send somebody here to investigate? The Foley's waited for over an hour for a Little Rock police officer to arrive and quickly dismiss their concerns. They brushed me off, she told Gina Monk of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Officers believed the scent to be sewage. Despite this disappointing discovery, the search continued Trevor, Abby's brother, spends his lunch hours searching the trunks of abandoned cars for his sister and traveling to other states following up on tips. Publicly, her parents beg for resolution. Just drop her off at a hospital, Michael suggests to an invisible monster. Tell us where her body is, Mom demands in a different tone. A $50,000 reward for information about her whereabouts was announced. More than a year after she was last seen, a large-scale search of Chalamont Park and the surrounding woods is executed. Three days long, police are joined by HALOS Investigations, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and two teams of bloodhounds. The scent dogs do not indicate that Ebby is in the area, and no major evidence is uncovered. By 2017, the police department's initial missteps treating Abby like a runaway, and their focus on investigating Abby's family has resulted in a very tense relationship between the two. 
the family hire a private investigator to hunt for Abby. Monty Vickers is a former Little Rock police detective. He assists with the strained communication between the department and the family, and also does some investigative work of his own. He chases down several false leads on social media. Strangers tormenting Ebby's family, creating Facebook pages in her name, demanding ransoms, and alleging that she was sold into slavery. These leads went nowhere and served only to fuel nightmares and remind good people how bad some others really can be. Detective Vickers does uncover some interesting information about the case. He says that Ebby had texted the men she was accusing of rape on the night of October 24th, the last night she was seen alive. If she had let them in on her plan to go to the police, would that have been a motive? Detective Vickers also speaks with Guy Hooper, the Chalamont Park security officer who had found Ebby's car. Detective Vickers learns that actually, it was a location that Ebby had been several times before. Ebby would, on occasion, meet a young man there, and the park guard had these interactions on tape. Guy Hooper told True Crime Daily that she was there and he had spoken with her just days before she had disappeared. Unfortunately, due to the police disinterest early on, these tapes were discarded. That summer, a pink Nike tennis shoe attached to a leg was found. It looked like it could be Ebby's, but it's not. Ebby's mom, Lori, said that she remained hopeful despite the multiple dead ends in the case. They hired a second private investigator, TJ Ward, who had gained fame working on the Natalie Holloway case. Changes in personnel are happening at the Little Rock Police Department, too. A cold case unit is created in 2017, and Detective Tommy Hudson comes out of retirement to join the group and Ebby's case. Detective Hudson and the cold case unit make slow progress. Re-interviewing witnesses and following leads barely covered initially. Ebby's grandparents were the last family to actually see her on Saturday, October 24th in 2015, but they weren't interviewed by the Little Rock Police until 2017, almost a year and a half after she disappeared. Danielle Westbrook as well had not been interviewed by police at all two years into the investigation. In February of 2018, the Jernigans file a complaint against three Little Rock police officers involved in Ebby's initial case. They victimized us on top of not looking for our daughter, telling us that she'd just show up, Ebby's mom, Lori Jernigan, said. They were just waiting to see if she'd show up. They were so rude, hateful, mean-spirited, untruthful to me and my husband. Lori submitted a number of conversations, text messages, and emails in support of her statement. She said one officer yelled at her, slammed files on the table, and told her not to call anymore regarding Ebby. He said, you will no longer be notified of anything going on in this case. You're not to show up. You're not to call us, Jernigan said. Gina Monk with the Arkansas Democrat Gazette reported that, fearful of retaliation, the Jernigans waited to file the complaint until the case was handed over to detectives in another unit. It's a catch-22, Lori said. Do you try to expose what's happened to you? Does that mean they're not going to follow up on our case? In the spring of 2018, the cold case unit resubmitted several pieces of evidence from the park to the state crime lab. While we don't know what evidence was re-examined, we do know that it leads investigators back to Chalamont Park. Detective Tommy Hudson said, There was some evidence we were looking at that was found at the scene when she initially disappeared that bothered us. It was something I just couldn't shake. I wanted to check the park again. There was a drainage pipe not far from the car, and it had rained in the days after she went missing, he said. So I kept thinking she might have been washed into the pipe which would have made it more difficult to find her. Robots with cameras are sent into the drain pipe. After locating an obstruction 70 feet into the drainage pipe, large digging equipment is brought in. 
The blockage was pulled up by the bulldozer and turned around, and there she was, right in front of me, Detective Hudson said. There was no doubt it was her. At 10.30 in the morning, Tuesday, May 22, 2018, a body was unearthed from the drainage pipe. The FBI evidence recovery team is called. Jewelry found on the skeleton matches missing items that had belonged to Abby, and her family is notified. Her remains are sent to the state crime lab for confirmation. On May 23rd, law enforcement report to the public that the body is Abby's. Margie Foley, Ebby's friend Kaylee's mother, who first reported the scent of decomposition at that drainage pipe back in November of 2015, was rightfully outraged. Not only had she been so quickly dismissed by responding officers that day, but she had left messages with the investigator on Ebby's case as well. Come to find out she's been here all this time, she said. We might have known what happened to her. It just makes me sick. Margie had also reminded police of the odor again during the search of the park in November 2016. She told Winnie Wright of KTH-TV, I'm very angry. I'm angry for Ebby. She didn't deserve to lay down there like that. Ebby's mother Lori is angry too. I was totally shocked and still am that she was there, just 50 feet from her car. It's heartbreaking. I'm pretty angry about that. Unfortunately, Detective Hudson did cite an abundance of rain as the reason that her body was swept so far into the pipe. He said, that's probably what led to her body being where it was so far down. Rain in the early days of the search may have additionally dampened spirits, but it definitely didn't obscure Ebby's scent from tracking dogs. In fact, contrary to popular belief, moisture and some rain is actually helpful for tracking and trailing dogs. More than likely, it was time and use of the park by other patrons that ruined the scent for those dogs. A full year had passed since Abby's life had been extinguished outside of that drainage pipe. Time can be so crucial in a missing person's investigation. As one mother finally finds her missing daughter a thousand miles away, the mother of another 18-year-old is beginning her own tragic search. It was a rainy and wet Saturday, dark and cold for me. Estela Calderon couldn't reach her teenage daughter, Selena. They usually texted each other every night, but there had been no messages for several days. Selena and her 14-month-old son, Estela's grandson, Owen, had moved into a new home in Sotus with Selena's boyfriend, just a few weeks prior. It's not only Estela. No one can reach Selena Hidalgo Calderon. The Wayne County Sheriff's Department receives the missing person's call and the reaction from law enforcement is swift and quick. Initial searches begin where Selena and Owen were last seen together near their new home on Joy Road. It's near the apple orchards outside of Sotus a small town in upstate New York near Lake Ontario. Friends and family described 18-year-old Selena as intelligent and hardworking. She was a loving and devoted mother and older sister. She loved her friends and making her friends laugh. She had fled violence in her home country and was supporting her family, working on farms and in the fields, but she had dreams of becoming a teacher. She had arrived in the United States from Guatemala with her family as a pregnant 17-year-old. She was not yet fluent in English, but she was committed to her new home in New York. She had applied for asylum and was diligently working through that process. In early 2017, Selena had given birth to a son, Owen. Estela called him the angel of his family's life. Selena had met her boyfriend, Alberto Reyes, after Owen was born. They were first introduced while working at a place called Melrose Farm. They started living together in November 2017 and moved together to the quaint Sodas area in upstate New York in April of 2018. Specifics shared with the public are of course vague, but sometime between November and May of 2018, 
Selena spent several days at a home for domestic violence victims in Wayne County. However, no reports were filed with the police. Selena's mother had heard from her daughter Wednesday, May 16th. Owen usually went to daycare while Selena worked, but he hadn't been in attendance Thursday the 17th or Friday, May 18th. On Tuesday the 22nd, investigators checked train stations and bus stations and interviewed family members near Syracuse. A search warrant was obtained for the home on Joy Road and a cadaver dog from the Greece Police Department alerted at the doorway. Wednesday is spent searching the orchard and farmland. Earlier the previous week, there had been border patrol activity in Sotus. Authorities thought it might have scared Selena into hiding. Thursday morning, May 24th, the local newspaper published an article about the search. We ask Selena to please come home. Rebecca Fuentes, a workers' center of Central New York advocate, said, We think that perhaps she was scared. She has immigration court on June 5th. But by that evening, the newspaper headline reads, Police find body of mom, Selena Hidalgo Calderon, one-year-old son still missing. The day before, deputies had obtained video from a hunting trail camera nearby. It had captured footage of Selena's 25-year-old boyfriend, Alberto Reyes, going into and out of the woods for five hours during the day of May 17th. This footage led to a discovery. At 10 a.m. in the morning, Wednesday, May 23rd, 2018, a body was unearthed from between two logs and hidden by dirt and branches. Selena's mom, Estela, says, I feel like a piece of my heart is gone. It had been less than 24 hours since the discovery of 18-year-old Abby Stebbick in Little Rock, and now Selena in New York, merely a week older than Abby at the time of her disappearance, is found a victim of domestic violence. Reyes was taken into custody and interviewed that night. Presented with the video evidence and with the assistance of Spanish language interpreters, he confesses to moving Selena's body into the woods. He admitted to burying but not killing Selena. He told authorities that he hid her body because he feared being blamed for her death. He is charged with felony evidence tampering. Alberto did not provide any information helpful in locating little Owen during interviews. It is determined that Alberto's phone had been thrown from the window of a moving vehicle during a ride to Attica, approximately 80 miles away. Two days following the discovery of Selena's body, on May 25th, Reyes's phone was recovered. It had been found on Route 104 between Sotus and Attica, as expected. Next, authorities issued an amber alert for Owen. They call it a Hail Mary, as they do not expect to find baby Owen alive and are hoping for a miracle. It is issued for upstate New York, in case he was removed from the farm. Despite this public call for help, a lot of attention is still on the Joy Road home, and on Saturday, May 26th, 165 people and a New York State Police helicopter searched the surrounding apple orchards. Wayne County Sheriff Barry Verts said in a news release, As a father and a grandfather, my heart would like to tell me that we would find young Owen alive, but my experience in law enforcement tells me that we will not. Three days later, May 29th, Alberto Reyes appeared with a public defender to waive a preliminary hearing. He is in the country illegally, having been deported twice before. Also that day, after reviewing the criteria, the Amber Alert for Owen is canceled. It was determined that because Reyes was in custody, and so Owen is not in his care, that it was a case that did not fit the requirements for the alert. But even though the Amber Alert was canceled, the search is still on. Wayne County Sheriff Verts spoke again about the search for Owen, saying that it would continue as long as necessary. He also said, I don't care about your race, creed, color, or national origin. If you are a victim, we're going to work hard to protect you. 
or bring justice to you. If you're a perpetrator, we're going to hunt you down. Sadly, on June 4th, Selena was laid to rest in a ceremony at St. Gregory's Church, and after 12 days hunting, the search for Owen was suspended. New York State Forest Ranger Lieutenant Charles Richardson said that it was unlikely that Owen was on the property. It doesn't mean that he's not, but we're at over 90% probability of detection right now. There's really no need for us to continue searching here until we get other information. Over the next few months, Reyes remained in police custody and law enforcement returned to the Joy Road farm repeatedly to search for the toddler. Searching that farmland and those apple orchards was an experience shared by over 1,100 people. Teams hunting for Selena and Owen Hidalgo Calderon covered more than 700 acres. Finally, at a press conference Tuesday, October 16th, five months later, the day after what would have been Selena's 19th birthday, the Wayne County Sheriff's Department announced a discovery. This is Sheriff Verts at that press conference. Uh, and we did a ground search uh, of the area, and that's where they found some skeletal remains. How many times before this instance that they searched that, that plot of land, that specific area? Well, I can say this, that uh, it was block one. It was identified as block one for a reason. Uh, that was probably uh, the most, where we probably had the most search, uh, the most people searching was that block one. Every single day when we were there uh, through the June 23rd, May 23rd through June 3rd, that block was searched every day. Incredibly, the bones had been found less than a quarter of a mile from where Selena had been located. Some of them were scattered and perhaps recently unearthed by wildlife. Reese PD uh, was out there uh, with their cadaver dog at least seven times uh, from the time of the search uh, through they were even out there with us uh, on Thursday. Uh, Grease PD was, so we, we, dogs were ran through that all the time. A forest ranger lieutenant spoke about the difficult search conditions. Dense May apples covered the ground and heavy rains had made the terrain an immense challenge. And of course, the evidence that they were looking for had been intentionally hidden. In this case, Sheriff Burst, he had a limited continuous plan to continue to search in that area, which he followed through to his credit, and, and that's what turned up the evidence. So I just want to be clear, okay, because it was stated in some media outlets that we had stopped. We never stopped investigating. We never quit. Two months later, in December, the Monroe County Medical Examiner's Office confirmed officially that the remains were Owen. In early 2019, Reyes was indicted on federal immigration charges. He had several aliases and had used forged documents to enter the United States and gain employment in New York illegally. He is charged with fraud for the counterfeit alien registration card and the social security card in the name of Alberto Gutierrez. A trial is scheduled and on September 11, 2019, Alberto Reyes pleads guilty to two counts of manslaughter. He did not give any reason why he killed Owen and Selena or provide any details on how they died. He only admitted that he caused their death. Reyes was sentenced to 20 years in prison for Owen and Selena Hidalgo Calderon's deaths. For the unrelated federal document charges, he is sentenced to two and a half years. Despite the heavy rains, prompt action, deliberate investigation, and the dedication of hundreds of people together were able to locate Selena and Owen Hidalgo Calderon and bring them some justice. Ebby Stepik's family still seeks justice to this day. Their search hasn't ended yet. In 2021, Detective Tommy Hudson retired. Ebby's mother told Dateline that she was devastated to see Hudson leave, but she is hopeful that the new detective, Bruce Maxwell, will solve the case and finally get justice for Abby. Detective Hudson believed that someone knows something about what happened to Abby, 
and even the smallest bit of information could help, that person can call the Little Rock Cold Case Unit.